before we start, I'll introduce um, my colleagues. So um, firstly, Joe Seymour. Uh, he is a chartered engineer and fellow of Engineers Ireland and a uh, fellow of the CHIT. CIHD also. He's got 25 years experience, uh, both in the public and private sector, um, with a particular expertise in traffic engineering. Um, he's been responsible for sustainable transport projects and urban improvement schemes uh, all around the world, Europe, Middle East and Africa. And he's currently the head of the active travel uh, investment team in the National Transport Authority of Ireland. Um, next is Noel Fennelly. Um, an experienced civil engineer and transportation professional with over 16 years experience post post graduation um, in the delivery of transport projects in Ireland. He's a uh, particular interest in sustainable transport uh, and climate mitigation and adaption measures. He's currently a program manager in the active travel team uh, in the NTA, overseeing a, a wide portfolio of uh, active travel projects in the Greater Dublin area. As I said earlier, he's the, he was one of the lead authors of the Cycle Design Manual um, and uh, is also uh, uh, an author of uh, the recently issued Deemer's Advice Note on uh, Priority Junction uh, Tightening Measures. He's also a current member of the Department of Transport National Guidelines and uh, Standards Oversight and Coordination Group. And then finally is Philip Lee, uh, a chartered engineer with uh, 23 years of experience um, in the planning, design, and management of transportation projects. He is currently a senior scheme designer uh, in the NTA Active Travel Support Office. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Joe. And uh, thanks, Joe. We can, see your, we can see your slides there. Okay, good morning, everyone. And thanks for coming back for uh, uh, another session. And hopefully we'll see as, uh, as many. We're up to... 750 odd already online and it's still growing so that's a great great numbers we we hit over a thousand last week uh, which is very impressive so today what i'm going to deal with is um priority control junctions very important part of all cycle infrastructure design and you'll see why uh, as we go through the presentation so where do we start what's the guiding principles i suppose really important point with priority junctions we have we cannot fully control all the movements within a priority control junction. We will have interactions between cyclists, pedestrians, and motorists. Uh, so what we need to do is minimize the conflict as much as possible, uh, and make sure any outcomes are fairly minor uh, in nature. We cannot signalize every junction. Uh, that a cycle route will follow or a pedestrian crosses. It's just not possible. The, the, the urban areas wouldn't function if we did this. So we need to design the priority control junctions in a manner that improves the interactions between uh, motorists. And I think it's safe to say from some of the stuff you'll see today is that we haven't always got this right in the past. The other aspect that we need to work on is directness making sure the, the the cyclist isn't delayed or isn't sent on too, too much of a detour as they go along a route, uh, as that will make it uh, uncompetitive against other modes if we expect a uh, cyclist to stop at every, every junction, uh, which is unrealistic and um, is unfairly disadvantaging uh, cyclists. So what are priority control junctions? The typical one is a T-junction. Uh, going into a housing estate or business park or whatever it is, or an access point into houses uh, or petrol stations, that type of thing. So they're pretty standard junctions. They make up most junctions that we have to deal with as designers uh, along corridors um, uh, because they're everywhere. In terms of cyclists, serious injuries by junctions, uh, the 46% of all uh, serious injury accidents happen at junctions. So they're, they're an important aspect of what we do. And when you look at these even more detail, most of these are at T-junctions. Uh, so 46% of um, uh, serious injury accidents are, are at T-junctions. So you can see how important these uh, the, 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 these junctions are in terms of how, it, uh, how we design our uh, infrastructure. And then when we look at MVCs or what's called multi-vehicle uh, collisions, 53% of cyclists seriously injured in MVCs were injured at a junction. 
So this is where most of these accidents occurred. And 22% of the other vehicles, so not the bicycle, uh, were turning right and 17% were turning left, whereas the, the cyclist was in generally going forward or going straight ahead. So they're getting taken out as the cyclist passes uh, the, the, the um, junction. Uh, we can assume, and from other research, that other uh, other um, uh, the other proportion of the accidents is the vehicles exiting the the side road and colliding with the cyclist that's going straight ahead. So, we know that there's accidents at junctions, and what do we do about it? One of the key things is to reduce the speed of vehicles. As a driver's speed, or as the car goes up, their driver's perception area significantly reduces. If we can keep speeds at junctions down to between 15, 25 kilometers an hour, the perception area for the driver is much more, um, he picks in, he, he or she picks it up the whole area much better so that they see the pedestrian, see the cyclist. As the speed goes up, that area becomes more and more confined. And as you go up to high speeds, you the, the, it's almost he's completely focused on the road ahead and not his surroundings. So that is, a, that is a, what, why we try and reduce speeds. That's why we aim to reduce speeds overall in the urban areas uh, through speed limits and why we're considering a, a significant reduction in urban speed limits at the moment. In the past, there was, in some instances where the uh, cyclists were expected to stop at every every priority control junction along the way. That is not an appropriate way of uh, designing. Uh, we are not doing that in 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 this uh, in in the current cycle design manual. Actually, it wasn't even in the last current uh, last cycle design manual. This wouldn't be appropriate design. As designers, it's very important that we understand. That not all vehicles are the same, though. The visibility from different vehicles uh, is very, very different. This is a video of uh, an articulated vehicle turning left at a junction, uh, and it's the driver's perspective of what they can see out the vehicle. Now, there are technologies that help on this and make it better, but most of the heavy goods vehicles or articulated vehicles that are out there probably don't have that yet. Uh, but you can see the, 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 the size of the blind spot that these articulated vehicles have. It's pretty significant. Uh, and um, we know from the accidents that happen in Dublin in particular, uh, where we have a lot of cyclists already, it's often with an articulated vehicle turning left or another heavy goods vehicle turning left. So those blind spots are critical in terms of design. So why are we changing what we're doing then so the design in the cycle manual is 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 about offsetting the the cycle lanes uh, uh away from traffic putting in uh islands that protect the the cyclists are uh, protect the um cyclists going through and slow the vehicles down this also improves the conflict angle or the uh the visibility angle for the the driver so that they can see the, the cyclists more clearly. So that, that is one of the primary changes we have in the new cycle design manual is pushing the cyclists a little bit away from the junction to improve that visibility and try and eliminate those blind spots or at least aid the blind spots a, a little bit. In terms of the rules of the road, and I, I think as designers, we often forget it. And as drivers, we 100% forget to go back and look at the rules of the road because they're constantly changing. We're actually doing an update at the moment with the RSA. Vehicles do not have an automatic right of way on the road. The overriding rule is, in all circumstances, to proceed with caution. And in the last line I really liked, to avoid doubt in the interest of road safety, a vehicle should always yield to pedestrians. That's what the rules of the road say. But is that what our roads are saying at the moment? Not sure it is. We, 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 we have big radiuses on, uh, on corners. We have blacktop going around and leading the drivers on. It almost gives the impression to drivers uh, subconsciously that they have the right of way always. And to be honest with you, that is how drivers are generally using our roads at the moment. Uh, and that is something that as engineers or planners, we can help with by redesigning junctions. So, Rather than starting with the cycle design manual, I think I'd start with the, the new advice note that uh, Paul mentioned that Noel wrote. Uh, that was his earlier in the summer uh, job before he was uh, focused on the cycle manual. It's a priority junction 
tightening measures. It's it's now published in the DMORS uh, website and is available for everybody to use. And this is very much how to redesign our junctions to be more pedestrian and cycle friendly. The photograph shows a typical housing estate in Ireland built in the probably 60s, 70s with huge radiuses that facilitate heavy goods vehicles that, that, that once a week bin lorry coming in and going around those corners very easily. But the problem is for the, the, the rest of the week, cars are going around those corners at speed. Uh, uh, and that, that type of design is not acceptable anymore. Now, this is an, a junction that's actually relatively new, probably the last, probably designed, say, 15 years ago, constructed 10 years ago. And it, I would call it its auto track led design. Auto track is where you, 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 you run around heavy goods vehicles and articulated vehicles around corners. And you make sure that you don't touch any curbs, you don't touch any vehicles or lines, and it results in, in very, very large junctions, which are appropriate in some locations, but in a lot of locations, they're, they're over-designed. You can see that van there is barely, um, it's, it's, a, or it's, it's a small van, but it's still taking up very little space in that junction, and you can appreciate how big that junction is. Those big radiuses results in cars coming in too quickly, and more importantly, going out too quickly. And if they go out too quickly, they don't see the cyclists coming along the, 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 the cycle lane. So it's all about slowing those down. Here's another example um, in the Dunleary area do in uh, Docky, where uh, we have a very big wide junction where two, three vehicles probably can uh, exit the, the road at the same time. Uh, and this has been narrowed down significantly, radiuses reduced to minimum, a raised crossing put in for pedestrians. And I think the, the, the important part of this is it all feels more compact. It's given uh, space back to for landscaping. But the, I, I feel one of the important aspects of this is it's now one lane exits from the, the, the side road where you have two lane exits or uh, an area that allows two cars to, to get out at the same time. One of the real problems is, especially now that we have more and more SUVs on the road, the vehicle turning right is blocking the visibility uh, for the, the vehicle turning left. And often the, the vehicle turning left creeps out and takes a chance a little bit when they see a bit of a gap, but they don't necessarily see the cyclist driving or cycling along the, the edge of the road. Uh, so they can be quite hazardous in those situations. So this is a big improvement in this location. And here's another one with slightly different way of doing it, where we the continuous footpath is put across the road uh, to really emphasize to the driver they don't have priority here. So it's a change. It's a change in how the road reads that uh, tells the, the driver that things are different. Another scheme closer uh, to Dublin city centre is Clontarf to, Clontarf to the city centre um, scheme. And this shows an older style design that was done in the late 90s. It includes the ramp, it includes the drop curbs, it includes to a certain extent tightening of the radiuses. So what I would say is we've understood this issue for a long time, but we're now taking it a step further. So that's what it looked like before from the 90s. This is what it looks like now in the current construction that's underway at the moment. It's all really tightened up. The vehicle has to, we'll say, jump over the footpath with uh, uh, relatively severe ramps, which is no issues for uh, a, a, any car on the road at the moment. Um, the, the footpath is kept level. The, the, the pedestrian and the cyclist runs through at the same level. So it, it, it really communicates a message to the drivers that we that is what we want. And this is what the Dutch have been doing for many years. They have uh, continuous footpaths and all. They have uh, prefabricated uh, ramps that they, they just put in everywhere uh, along roads. And they use paviors and things to make sure that it's a different, it reads differently to the, the main road next to it. So in the cycle design manual, there's some recommendations in terms of uh, where cycle priority is recommended and where it should be considered and where it's vehicle priority is recommended. So we're not saying this is the correct thing everywhere. We're saying it's the local context that's really important. So in a city center with low speeds, generally cycle priority is recommended. Where we move out to higher speeds, it's vehicle priority recommended, which you'd, you'd expect. And the same, Almost the same type of table is available in the DMORS manual, uh, but for continuous crossings for footpaths. So in the city center, low speed environment, it's continuous footpath. And then we move out to um, 
uh, dished crossings where the vehicle keeps priority out in the outer areas where the speeds are higher. So very, very similar table for both of them, but they're both available in the two different documents. So for, for, for a cycle lane passing a priority control junction, in the past, we would have gone with no setback. The cycle lane, and it would generally be in, have been markings, would run along the front of the junction. We want to move towards a full setback over the next few years um, uh, where we can because uh, it improves the conflict angle. So motors have better visibility of uh, crossing cyclists and cyclists are kept out of blind spots provides additional deceleration space and reaction time for motorists and provides a waiting space for cars to yield without blocking the cycle track or main road and provides space to incorporate additional yield markings and signage. You can see in this, this scenario here, the car is waiting for the cyclist to go through. In the Netherlands, they don't have that much extra markings. They don't have that much. Uh, they have some basic uh, line markings, but they don't have big signs. We feel probably for the initial period, we may need a, a little bit of extra markings and signage to reinforce the new measures uh, as people get used to them over the next few years. Where we're doing the cycle lane in front of um, uh, priority junctions, we want to run the, 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 the curbing through where we can. We have a color differential where we can on the cycle track. Um, and uh, we remove the, the, the radii as much as possible, or at least the reading of the radii. The radii are still there virtually uh, for the vehicle, but don't have them read, don't read it as, a, a, as an edge curb, because when this, the driver sees the edge curb, that's my space, and we want to avoid that. Um, but we're not always doing this. Vehicle priority will not be granted always. As I said earlier, as the speeds go up, it, it, it'll reduce. Uh, and uh, we, we have put in designs where cyclists uh, are, are guided to, to yield or stop in certain situations. Now, that has been used a lot in the past. Uh, that is uh, even on roads that are suitable for other types of junctions. We don't want to see that going forward. That's not that's not uh, appropriate design uh, going along the side roads. Now, I have seen a recent new development by a private developer where this was put in. That's not what we're looking for. We want to make sure that the, the, the cyclist maintains priority across road priority junctions like like this, with particularly with low flows in uh, vehicles, uh, vehicles in and out where we have now more segregated facilities. It's important that opposite priority junctions that we have gaps in the um, in the cycle tracks to allow cyclists to enter the segregated facilities. It's something that we, we, we have forgotten about in the past, but we need to make sure it, it happens in future. So this is a cyclist entering a segregated facility on the CMAR in Dunleary, and it's nice, easy uh, for the cyclists to do it. And it's nice and easy for all types of bikes to do it. Here's another example on the Haute Road, uh, where a, a really nicely designed connection is provided uh, to the, to the two-way cycle track that runs along the coast there. And at entrances to houses, uh, Rather than in the past where the cyclist or the cyclist and the pedestrian ramped up and down to facilitate the car, the car now gets ramped up and into the driveway. So the curb edges will be tapered so that the car uh, can, can in, uh, um, access the property. Uh, so it's a different approach. It's almost reversing what was done in the past, uh, whereas the vehicle now ramps and the pedestrians and cyclists stay more or less at the same level. You can drop the levels uh, and you will have to in times, but you make sure it's over a, 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 a long area that it's imperceptible to the pedestrian and cyclist. And here's a good example in Pottery Road, which has been around for many years in Dunleary, uh, which is 10 years plus at this stage. And you can see the, the curbs have the ramps in them uh, to allow the uh, access to the houses and it works really well. Uh, and another more recent example on Templeville Road in South Dublin, the, the outer edge is ramped, quite easy to do uh, uh, for, for vehicles. And you can do that at petrol stations uh, as well. I do think the red surfacing that we, we, we would like going forward will help on this uh, significantly as it will really highlight uh, the presence of the, the cycle track in these locations. So there's one petrol station and another one on the Clontarf to city centre. And you can see same principle as a priority control junction running along the, the, the side. The curb continues and slight taper on the curbs to allow vehicles to access uh, the location. And as we roll out these massive uh, networks that we're planning over the next few years, 
we hopefully will have major cycle routes meeting at junctions. So we've come up with a protected uh, junction layout for priority junctions uh, for two meeting routes. And this, this provides a dedicated space for cycling, which caters for all cycle movements, maintains segregation between all modes, reduces crossing distances and creates stacking spaces. And there are variations on this in the Netherlands. In addition, as we hopefully roll out even more uh, advanced schemes, we could look at other priority control junction types. And this is a priority square, which is not in the cycle manual at the moment, but has most of the principles of um, uh, what's included in this are in the, in the manual in some ways. And this priority square is in between a priority junction and a roundabout, and it provides uh, plenty of capacity for vehicles as well as good control for cyclists. So this is what this location looked like in Utrecht before, fully standard signal control junction with lots of lanes. Uh, and this was all narrowed down um, uh, and provided this um, priority square in the middle of the junction, so no more signals. Uh, along the way and it works really well and this is a video for you for those of you who have done the trip to Utrecht as part of our study tours uh, I think most of the the study tours end up in this location and it's it, it's it's really good and you can see that the, the cyclist doesn't always keep priority you can see the cyclist is looking over to see the cars coming slows down doesn't have to put the foot in the ground because they can see they have plenty of space to see the vehicles coming uh, and they, they they can keep going around the, the, the cycle route. And then on the side roads, they keep the priority. So when they're on the main line, they keep the priority as much as possible and the cars give way. But on the as they cross the um the main line, again, they yield to the to, to the other vehicles. So it's a good way of illustrating how our, our cycle infrastructure could evolve over the next few years as we get a really good connected network together. And that's me. Over, back over to you, Paul. That's great. Thanks, uh, Joe, for that. Uh, as Joe said at the start of the, his presentation, not all junctions can be signalised, obviously. But uh, Noel Fenley now is going to speak uh, more about signalised uh, junctions and also a bit more detail on, on protected junctions. So uh, I'll hand over to you now, Noel. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's 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 great to be here uh, with, you, with you again this morning. And uh, as was said, it's great to see huge numbers tuning in. Um, and I hope you're all managing to keep uh, stay safe and dry out there as a storm. But bed passes us uh, this morning and yesterday and, and into today. So uh, in this presentation this morning, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the guidance in the manual on signal control junctions. So section 4.4 gives the detail, really, the text and all the background information on signal control junctions. The typical layouts then um, for signal control junctions are in the appendix. They're currently TL uh, 501 to 509. And I suppose it's important to emphasize that full, full junction layouts are illustrated. I suppose you have to, you have to show some, some sort of a scenario. And these are typically simple forearm junctions, um, which obviously these layouts will need to be tailored to suit site-specific circumstances, um, you know, depending on site geometry, number of uh, number of lanes, number of approaches, et cetera. So um, yeah, designers will need to use those templates as as, as, as a basis for develop, developing up their designs but following the principles then of the, of the manual. And the designs should also be guided by the main requirements for signal control junctions, which we'll have a quick look at now. So the first one up is safety. Um, and Joe showed this image last week, so I, I won't dwell on it. But I suppose, look, suffice to say that, you know, unfortunately, incidents like this can and, and do occur at signalised junctions, particularly, you know, if the facilities for cycling are, aren't great, you know, um, and look, fat fatalities can can unfortunately happen. Uh, you know, and as Joe mentioned, a lot of a lot of serious injuries uh, also occurred at urban junctions. So safety really, really is paramount when it comes to signal control junction design. Um, and as well, if you, if you recall, those of you who were with us last week, safety also includes perceived safety. So junctions also need to feel safe um, if we want to attract new and less confident users to the network. So how do we improve safety and signal junction? Well, the recommendation in the manual is that, is that we adopt a safe system approach so that the potential for conflict is minimized and that if and when collisions do occur, that no one is killed or seriously injured. So we spoke about this last week again about the safe system approach and really at the heart of that it's about recognizing that humans are, are fallible you know we make mistakes and that our bodies are fragile in the, in the in the grand scheme of things despite what we might think um so designs really need to to account for that so applying the safe system approach then to junction design will include a number of key aspects and they're, and they're listed there so such as separating cyclists from motor traffic uh, and pedestrians to the greatest extent possible ensuring layouts are legible and forgiving 
ensuring motor vehicle speeds are slow, as Joe mentioned, um, and providing sh the shortest crossing distance is really possible to minimize that potential for conflict with motor vehicles. Then looking at directness, the next requirements. So directness is really all about minimizing delay. And there's a number of, of, of things you designers can, can, can look at to minimize delay. They're, they're listed there. I won't go through them. But um, what I would just like to say is, 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 is really we need to just remember that cycling, you know, you, you're cycling under your own steam. It's, it requires physical effort. Uh, and, and perhaps a little known fact is that to take off from a, a stationary position on, 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 on a bike um, requires roughly about the same energy as cycling about 75 to 100 meters in, in free flowing cycle conditions, depending on your speed. So what that means, really, if a cyclist has to stop 10 times along a route, um, you know, that's like they've essentially cycled an extra kilometer on that journey because of the additional energy required for all those stop starts. Um, and, and, and if you're cycling in... in in current conditions, um, in in any town or city in Ireland, cycling uh, having to stop ten times on a route is 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 certainly not beyond the bounds of possibility. Um, I think I, I counted on, on my commute to work. I have to stop about fifteen times, so I'm technically cycling about an extra kilometer and a half on the way in and the way home. So directness is is, is really really important. Trying to minimise delay. Um, coherence then is about having consistent legible facilities and um, legible junctions that are easily understood by cyclists and indeed all road users. So really, it's about from a cyclist perspective, ensuring you know cyclists know what's expected of them, where they're supposed to be, where how they travel through the junction, and then from uh, you know just a, a road user perspective, then pedestrians and motorists also need to know what's expected of them and where they can expect cyclists to be. And then comfort then is the last requirement. So the key aspects for comfort then this is also really important for signal junction design. So you need to ensure that there's sufficient width, um, addition sta ad adequate stacking space, should I say, um, smooth surfacing and transitions are also really important. And also to improve the comfort, you know, you can look at incorporating additional facilities such as footrests and, and balancing aids. As you can see, that the, we're starting to see some of those um, appear in Ireland and they're, they're used widely enough on, on the continent as well. Um, the image on the bottom right-hand corner is a uh, junction in Dunleary where a footrest was recently installed. Okay, so moving on then to, to, to what the manual says on protected junctions. Um, so protected junctions, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, they're, they're essentially just signal control junctions that include segregated cyclic facilities to improve um, cyclist safety. And that's both actual safety, again, as we mentioned, and perceived safety, which is also a, a, critical, a critical aspect. So protected junctions aren't new. They, they've been used extensively in the Netherlands, where, where the concept was developed. Um, and they've been used there for many years, and they are being adopted by a growing number of countries globally, uh, you know, including the UK and many other European countries. Uh, in America, in Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, you know the list is the list is growing all the time. Really, um, they are, however, I suppose, relatively new in an Irish context. So we're playing a little bit of catch up. Um, you could say uh, we've only built a handful of them at the moment, but that will hopefully change over time. Um, we should be seeing many more of these because, as is stated there in in section four four three one of the manual. Really protected junctions are the preferred arrangements for signal control junctions going forward. So if you've got a signal control junction, your first your first choice should be looking at, can we get a protected layout in, in here? Um, and just on the right-hand side, there's a link to a useful video. Um, I Unfortunately, it's about five or six minutes long, so I don't have time to share, share today. Um, but if anyone wants to watch that in their own time, it's a good explainer on, on, on protected junctions and the principles behind them. Please don't go look at it now. You, you, I'd appreciate it if you can stay with me for a few more minutes, but you can look at that in, in your own time. It's on protectedintersection.com. Actually, just remember in that video, that's in a North American context, obviously. Driving and cycling is on the opposite side of the road. So before we look at the protected junctions themselves, I just want to highlight there's four key common features um, of protected layouts. We've we've shown three different variations of protected layouts in, in the manual for use, and they all have these four key common features. So the first one is the orbital cycle track, which is the dedicated space for people cycling, and it's segregated from other modes. So you can see that's highlighted in, in yellow on this layout. Protected corner islands then is a really, really, really important aspect. So these are raised corner islands, typically elliptical in shape. They provide protection from turning vehicles and a safe space for cyclists waiting to cross. Um, and as Joe mentioned, the use of tight corner radii really is, is, is crucial when we're, when we're looking at these islands, you know, to ensure motor vehicle speeds are slow. Um, and you can incorporate, as, as what's shown there in grey on the corners, is actually a, an overrun area for HGVs. So, you know, we, we appreciate that there will be instances where HGVs, you know, we need to be accommodated. Um, absolutely. And, you know, you can look at overrun areas, but it's important that we design the, the, the radius on that overrun area as, as tight as possible to make sure we maintain 
car speeds uh, slow through the junction because cars are going to be the majority of vehicles using junctions in all cases, really. Uh, the third common feature then is setback parallel crossings. So setback crossings, as Joe mentioned, really improve the vi visibility at the conflict point. They give additional reaction space and time and create stacking space for cyclists as well. Typically, that's a five meter setback or one, one car space. Um, that's not always going to be achievable, but that, that's really what the aim should be. Um, and then obviously the parallel aspect is the pedestrians and cyclists cross in separate, separate parallel crossings. Um, so they have their own dedicated space to cross. And then the last common feature then is forward stop lines for cyclists, as are highlighted there. Um, so these increase the visibility of cyclists by putting them in advance of the motorists. Um, and they also reduce the crossing distance then for cyclists. So I suppose they, they, they're the four key features which are common to the different protected junction layouts in the manual, which we'll, we'll now go on to look at. So as I say, we've uh, three types of protected junction layouts in, in the manual. So if you're number one, there's your standard protected junction really um, based on the Dutch design. Uh, then you have the Cyclops layout, which is a more recent innovation from the UK, and then a protected junction with full signal control, which is um, something we've imp implemented in, in Ireland recently as well. Okay, so just looking at each of those individually then. So the protected junction, the first one is, it, as I say, that's the, the standard type of protected junction is based on the, the Dutch um, principles really and, and how they've developed their protected junctions over, over the years. Um, the layout, as I say, has the four common features that we've just looked at, which is the orbital cycle track, the corner islands, setback parallel crossings and the forward stop lines. But the key features of, of this layout are, are that the pedestrians cross the cycle track uh, with priority on, on a raised zebra crossing. Um, and then they cross uh, to, to a landing area where they then uh, wave to cross the road under signal control. So what you're doing in that, in that, in that scenario, you're, 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 you're dealing with the pedestrian and cyclist conflict outside of the signal control arrangement. Pedestrians still maintain priority uh, uh, because the zebra there and cyclists yield to, to, to pedestrians crossing at that point. Um, so potential advantages of, of this protected junction uh, arrangement then is a shorter, I suppose, potential advantage compared to compared to the other layout. So there's a shorter crossing distances potentially. Um, that's distance shorter crossings of the carriageway for both pedestrians and cyclists. So favorable for both modes really. More stacking space is created in this layout potentially because of the protected corner islands and, and the setback. Um, and potentially, you know, improve junction efficiency as well because uh, pedestrians and cyclists will go on the same stage and uh, the crossing distances are shorter, so it'll require less time in your in your cycle. Um, potential disadvantages of this layout there may require more space than other protected layouts to implement, and it will introduce more ramped crossings um, uh, and locations where cyclists will need to yield. So that's the first one. Moving on then to, to the Cyclops layout, which which, as I mentioned, is, 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 is a recent sort of variation on the protected layout that's been developed in the UK in recent years and has been implemented in, you know, uh, Greater Manchester and, uh, and other locations. Um, it's a variation of the protected junction layout, as I say, where the cycle track actually diverts outside of the pedestrian crossings and the pedestrian crossings are then on the inside of the cycle crossings at the junction. Um, it might be best explained this actually if I just jump back a second. So just if we're, if we're looking at the first version again, so the, the sort of standard Dutch um, approach, if you if you look at, say, coming from the south there, you have going from left to right, you have a footpath, then your cycle track, and then your, your carriageway. And as you go up then, it's, it's a, a cycle crossing the, 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 the arm on the west, that's maintained that, 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 that same order. So your, your pedestrian crossing on the, on the left, your cycle crossing then beside it on the right, and then your, your traffic in the center of the junction. Moving back to Cyclops, then Cyclops on the approach road again, coming from the south, it, 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 it's the same. You have your footpath, cycle track, carriageway. But then as you see, as, as, as it approaches the junction, the cycle track um, diverts to the around the pedestrian crossings. And at the crossing point on the main, on the main road, the cycle, the cycle crossing is actually outside of the pedestrian crossing, which is the closest to the center of the junction. So that's really the, the, the key difference between Cyclops and, and, and the standard and standard layout. Um, so yeah, as I say, the key features on, on Cyclops then, it, 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 like the other the other protected junction layout, it, it does have raised pedestrian crossings, raised zebra crossings, um, and then pedestrians cross the footpath on with priority on those crossings to go to corner refuge islands, um, which which we would recommend are, are raised in all cases. The UK have 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 tried a few different variations of, of those at grade and, and raised, and I look at I think uh, it looks like they're, they're going to settle on, on, on raised corner islands really um, so that's the, the recommended approach from ourselves as well um, and as I say pedestrians then cross on the inside of, of the cyclists at, at the junction so potential advantages then of a cyclops arrangement compared to others are there less zebra crossings for cyclists um, 
There's an opportunity to include diagonal pedestrian crossings if required, and a more circular cycle track may be more comfortable for cycling. Potential disadvantages of this layout then, that there's increased interaction between pedestrians and cyclists um, due to the consolidation of zebra crossings. Some pedestrians may feel less safe or more isolated on the corner islands and perhaps a slightly longer, uh, more circuitous route for cyclists. So moving on then to the third, um, the third layout we have in the manual. Uh, so this is protected junction with full signal control. So really the key features to this one is all, all movements are, are, are controlled by traffic signals, um, which uh, as per point two there, that really introduces the need for an additional additional stop lines for cyclists in advance of the pedestrian crossings because when the when the green man is showing for pedestrian cyclists need to be uh, given given the warning to the instruction to, to stop at that point. Um, another key feature I suppose is that there, you're generally going to end up with smaller corner islands on 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 this layout compared to the, the other layouts. So the potential advantages of this layout then are that it requires less space to implement typically um, and pedestrians may have more controlled priority over the cycle track because again that's a signal controlled um, conflict whereas in the other two layouts it's a, a, on, a, on a zebra crossing. There are however some potential disadvantages um, to this to this junction also so you know it, it, it's probably going to introduce longer crossings for pedestrians and cyclists and that's longer in terms of distance and also in terms of time that's going to, going to need to be factored in for your for your junction cycle. Um, setback crossings may be more difficult to achieve. The smaller corner islands may feel potentially less safe um, as if you're a cyclist there you know traffic will be the traffic turning the corner will be will be a lot closer to you which may be perceptively less safe. Um, and potentially less stacking space available in comparison to the other options. So just as a bit of a recap, I just, uh, I, I won't really say much about this, but just uh, for future reference, if anyone wants to go back and look at the slides, I just thought it might be handy to, to put three junctions uh, side by side there. And something I forgot to, uh, uh, that I failed to mention actually in the first two, so the protected junction and the protected junction with Cyclops layout, cyclists get what's called, you know, what we would call a free left turn really. So cyclists can, can make left turns at the junction outside of the signal control arrangements and they just need to yield to pedestrians at, at the zebra crossing. So that's another key feature for the, for the first two layouts. So moving on there, uh, just, just quickly to mention, so we do have a lot of protected, uh, sorry, we do have a lot of signal control T junctions uh, in, in Ireland. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to need to, uh, you know, do, do come up with a lot of signal controlled junction designs that cater for cyclists adequately um, uh, at T junctions. So we've included some some layouts here. These are essentially the same as the four armed layouts that we've we've just looked at really for the protected junction and the protected junction for full signal control. These are just three armed versions. So it's the same key feature, same advantages, same principles. We we just felt it was important to include these to give designers a, a template to work off of. And one thing I suppose just to note on the bottom there that the cyclops arrangement is not shown in the manual. It's it's you know it's probably less transferable to a T junction layout. Um, it may require more space to implement and or, and or it may introduce some sort of more, you know, potentially more interaction between pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so look, that's, we haven't shown it. That's not to say it can't be done. It can be done and we've seen it done in the UK, but it, you know, it's potentially, our recommendation would be for protected signal control T junctions, you know, that you'd, you'd look at one of these two layouts um, first and foremost. Okay, so that's that's the protected junctions. A uh, bit of a whistle stop tour there, but look, if you have any queries, please please do let us know. And as I say, go, would encourage you to go and have a, have a good read and, and have a good study of the the, the typical layouts in the, in the manual themselves. Um, so moving on in section four four four, uh, outline some other junction signal control junction arrangements. Um, which which uh, may may be may be used uh, depending on circumstances. But I suppose look, it's important to remember that what's what's highlighted on the top there that really um, protected junction layouts are the preferred arrangements for signal control junctions. So that should be the case. You should always be looking at protected arrangements going forward. However, that being said, there will be circumstances where protected layout, you know, isn't possible or isn't feasible. Uh, you know, for example, if it's an interim or a temporary scheme or in exceptionally constrained environments. So under those circumstances, you know, you may need to consider the other signal control junction arrangements uh, that we we'll look at now in section 444. So we've included five of them there. Well, actually for uh, the last one, streaming lanes is really only for legacy junctions. And I'll, I'll touch on that briefly in a few moments. But um, all of these, I suppose the designers will be well familiar with these. These these are um, all designs really that were were in accordance with the old, uh, the previous National Cycle Manual. Um, 
And I suppose one one important thing to highlight really is, is what's what's highlighted on the bottom there. So for new developments or locations that are not heavily constrained, a departure would be required to, to use any of any of these layouts. So really, again, that goes back to the point that we, we should be looking at protected junctions first first and foremost. Um, okay, I'm not going to go through these in 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 in, in huge amount of detail. As I said, the designers should be familiar with them. They're, they're in the old manual. Um, I'm just going to touch on some of the some of the some of the new newer requirements, shall we say? So, signal control junction with token crossings. Um, look, as as stated there, you know these are shared facilities, really, that generally disliked by both pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so really, signal control junctions with token crossings should only be used in exceptionally constrained environments or as part of interim cycle schemes, or where a shared active travel facility uh, exists on the approach roads. So really, I suppose, if you have a scheme where cycle track and footpaths are segregated on the approach roads to a signal control junction, that segregation really should be maintained through the junction rather than reverting to this sort of shared space design, which we which we sort of had a tendency to do in the past. Um, you know, we really need to move away from this type of layout to meet the needs of cyclists and to treat cycling uh, as a serious mode of transport. Um, one thing I would just highlight, if 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 any of these layouts are being introduced, please do, as, as is shown in the typical layout there, the correct tactiles need to be used. And that's really, really important. So the, the tactiles are the ladder and tramline tactiles, which are actually the flat topped bars, as is indicated there in the top left. You can see the, the, the profile and, and the cross section. Um, often, in, in many cases in the past, the standard round rounded corduroy hazard tactiles have been used incorrectly um, at these, and they can be they can be quite hazardous for cyclists. Whereas these ones uh, with the flat top bars have a wider spacing. You see, there's 70 mil there uh, spacing in between the bars, and these have been used quite successfully in the UK for 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 many years. Um, so really important where we're using shared facilities that we use the, the correct tactiles. So just moving on, that's uh, two, two stage right turns. So this replaces the previous box turn layout in the manual. It's essentially very, very similar, similar principles, similar approach as, as, as the previous box turn layout, just revised road markings really. And I suppose the, the, the rationale for this was that we, we, we're we aware, I suppose that the, the box turn layout, you know, perhaps wasn't uh, the most well understood layout, even for experienced cyclists, you know, some some didn't really understand what what they were supposed to do. So we're taking a bit. Of, we've taken a bit of inspiration here from from the Netherlands for this one as well. Um, and really, what's what would happen? I suppose to explain it for for anyone who's who's not familiar. If you're a cyclist, if you look at the diagram on the left there, if you're a cyclist coming from the right hand side, and you want to turn right, say heading north through that junction. So when you get a green light, so you're you're gover you're, you're controlled by the, the overall traffic signals. There isn't dedicated cycle signals in, in this. Um, uh, so you're just with, with with the normal flows of traffic. So if you get a green signal, you proceed into the junction and you pull into the kind of wedge shaped area on the left. Oh, sorry, on the on the in in the mouth of the south arm of the junction there, and you wait there and then proceed to cross the junction when you get a when when the southern arm gets a gets gets the green light to go. So that's um, that's essentially how the, how how that's supposed to operate. Uh, and I suppose we what we've done is is keep that right turn pocket we've we've kept it within the extents of the elephant footprint so it's within the the cycle crossing and it's still on the the, the red surfacing which you know there are going to be two key elements in, in in this type of layout so hopefully that's more legible uh where, where these layouts need to be implemented uh advanced stop line so again you'll all be very familiar with with these with the, the, these are on uh, many roads in, in in cities towns and villages in, around the country um and you know look they, 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 they have been useful throughout the years um and they, they still continue to be useful but really um they're only useful for for cyclists who you know perhaps more experienced and confident because you are dealing with motor traffic um and they're only really useful as well when if you arrive at the junction when when the signal is on red so if the signal's on red, it allows you to kind of get in front of traffic. And if you're if you're turning right, it allows you to position yourself um, more appropriately in the junction. But really, I suppose getting back to the point that we're 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 trying to, uh, you know, produce uh, or implement facilities that are, are suitable for people of all ages and all abilities and attract new users to the network. Really, what's highlighted there in the boxes: new ASLs should therefore only be considered in exceptional circumstances and only on junction approaches where the traffic conditions are suitable for a mixed cycling environment. So you'll need to refer to the thresholds in Table Two Point One. Um, and where ASLs are are being implemented, they should only be used on single end approaches. So ASLs across multiple end approaches are are, are not recommended because you can end up in a quite a precarious situation where um, you know a cyclist wanting to turn right. Uh, could be 
essentially trapped in between two opposing traffic streams. So traffic turning left from a side road and traffic turning right off the main road and a cyclist could be essentially trapped in, in, in the middle. So as I say, ASLs across multi-lane approaches is certainly not recommended. Uh, so then that leads us on to streaming lanes. And as I said at the start, the, or a couple of moments ago, these are really, we've only included these uh, to try and deal with some legacy streaming lanes that we, we have out there on the network at the moment. So streaming lanes, important. Uh, and the box down the right-hand side to note, the streaming lanes are no longer recommended for use in new scheme design. So really we shouldn't be seeing any more of these. And for those that may be unfamiliar, a streaming lane is where the cycle lane essentially is, 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 is travels between uh, two, two, two traffic lanes. So generally a left turn lane and a, and a straight ahead lane. Um, so look, it, it is a, it can be a fairly precarious position for cyclists to be in. Um, certainly not suitable for people of all ages and abilities. We really don't want to see any more streaming lanes in any designs going forward. And I say the only reason we've included them is because, you know, where, where streaming lanes currently exist, you know, interim measures, we would recommend that interim measures are considered to improve the safety of cyclists uh, pending a permanent solution. So moving on into the last section uh, under signal controlled junctions, which is uh, section 445, which provides some guidance on, on, on signal control operations and components for cycle infrastructure, I suppose, very important uh, for designers and designers will be aware of this, that, you know, the traffic science manual really governs the requirements for traffic signals. So really designers should be referring to the traffic science manual for most up-to-date guidance. Um, there's quite a bit of detail in this section also. So most of which is the designers will be familiar with. I'm just, so I'm just going to briefly highlight some of the, some of the newer features and requirements. So the first one up, um, we're looking at uh, uh, introducing a single aspect, low level cycle signal for optional use at separate crossings of cycle tracks. So I suppose the first first and most important thing to, to mention here is that in normal circumstances, zebra crossings of cycle tracks will typically be controlled by signage and, and markings. Um, so that, that should be the default really position. Um, in some circumstances, however, uh, the, the manual recommends that where, where it's necessary, considered necessary to provide additional control measures, the use of cycle signals can be considered. And this new uh, single aspect, low level cycle signal is being developed as an alternative to full signals. So you can see the image on the left, that's the prototype that's been developed. Um, and on the right hand side, that's a 3D visualization of what that might look like at an island bus stop. Um, so look, as I said, this trial trial is uh, hopefully going to, to take place on using these in, in the coming months. And we, we might issue further guidance on, on foot of that trial. And just to mention, this, I suppose, how, how this would operate in the default setting, um, the fla a flashing amber signal will be given cyclists to warn them to proceed with caution if no pedestrians are present. And then if a pedestrian uh, needs to use that facility then to cross, um, to cross the cycle track, they can call the, call the, call the signal prep, uh, via push button. And then when that's activated, cyclists will be given a red signal and pedestrians will get an audible signal to cross the cycle track. So I suppose watch, watch the space in terms of that. Um, this is also this is a new requirement, so this is this is a very important one as well. So the location of push button units, um, where where they're being used for for detection of cyclists. Um, so push button units must be located so that they're accessible to all, including those using non-standard cycles. So I suppose look, there's been a tendency in the past to locate push button units on the same poles as the cycle signals, which can lead to precarious enough situations where you know your your front wheel might end up on, on the carriageway and that's even in a, using a standard uh bicycle uh so obviously the situation would be much worse for for the likes of a front loading cargo bike so really everyone must be able to reach the push button unit without their cycle encroaching the carriageway so we've come up with a recommended minimum distance of 1.5 meters that the push button unit should be located from the edge of the carriageway now that may in 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 some cases uh, in a lot of cases perhaps might mean that standalone poles are required for push button units which is is obviously create a, a more expense and a bit more clutter which is obviously not what where we want to go but this really really is an important safety issue so on safety grounds we feel it's 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 important and i suppose just to note that that's the picture there on the left is actually from the uk uh, that's um a cyclops junction recently uh, implemented in Cambridge, so the UK have have have, have gone this direction, and you know in in, in continental Europe and in, in the Netherlands and other places they have been following this approach for for years. So it's 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 just it's an important um it's an important aspect that we need to start getting uh, improving going forward. Then there's an important uh, some important advice on minimizing conflicts between turning motor traffic and and, and cyclists. So um. Turn, right turning motor traffic and straight ahead cyclists. And the advice is that where practicable, 
they, that that conflict should always be separately staged in a junction under signal control. Um, and as Joe highlighted, that's a, that's a very serious risk. And um, so, look, always try and separately stage that conflict to to, to minimise that risk. In terms of left turning motor traffic, um, preferably again. The preference would be to separately stage to eliminate the, the conflict risk and going back to the principles of, of, of you know, um, safe systems approach. However, we do recognize that, you know, at, at signal control junctions with lower limits or sorry, lower volumes of left turning motor traffic um, to achieve op optimum operational effectiveness, including the efficient movement of cyclists, which, again, is important in terms of the reducing delay to cyclists. So in those situations, consideration can be given to permitting straight ahead cyclists and left turning motor traffic to proceed at the same time in what's called a partial conflict arrangement. So I suppose these uh, important to note that this kind of an arrangement uh, is in use in, in, in some jurisdictions internationally. So we're, we're, we've taken a bit of guidance from, um, as I say, uh, from abroad in, in terms of this. Um, so table 424 there includes some thresholds, important thresholds to take note of. So for, for, for left turning uh, partial conflicts to be permitted or not. So basically, if you have up to 100 left turning motor vehicles, uh, sorry, 100 PCU in the peak hour, so the passenger car units in the peak hour, um, partial conflict is permitted um, and can be considered. If you've essentially between 100 and 150 left turning PCUs in the peak hour, departure will be required. And if you have over 150 PCUs left turning in the peak hour, partial conflict is not recommended, it's not permitted as well as the thresholds that you need to uh, factor in uh, some other important points there on, on the right-hand side. So partial conflicts are also strongly discouraged. Uh, you know, if the volume of left-turning traffic exceeds 150 PCU, as, as, as I mentioned, if a two-way cycle track crosses a junction uh, and in rural locations with higher traffic speeds or where large volumes of HGVs might be turning left. So example, into a, an industrial estate. So this is my last uh, slide now, Paul. Um, so, yeah, in terms of partial conflicts, then um, where they are being considered, the manual recommends a couple of additional features, which which should be uh, should be implemented, really. And they're listed there. So that's an early start for cyclists should be provided. Um, a flashing amber arrow signal should be used in place of a full green aspect to warn left turning motorists that they are to proceed with caution. And I'll show you a quick video of that in a second. Uh, flashing amber LED studs may be included on the inside of the cycle crossing. So that's on the inside of the junction. Um, so as the right hand side of the cycle crossing, as you're looking at it, setback stop lines for general traffic uh, should be included also to, again to increase cyclist visibility, let get them out in front um, from a stationary position and supplementary yield markings and signage may be, may be, may be considered also. So as I said, hopefully uh, this video will work now. It's just a, a very short video here of, of a flashing amber. Um, so partial conflict arrangement with a flashing amber hour that's that's been implemented recently on the, on the Rock Road in Dunleary. And just before I click play, just to show you here, that's so as you can see here, the straight ahead traffic has a green a green arrow to proceed. And this low level cycle signal here, you can see that's that's on green as well. And cyclists have an, a, a forward stop line and the vehicle stop line is set back. So, uh, from a stationary position, cyclists are much more visible to, to the motorist. Uh, and then, as you'll see here, if I click play, that uh, you can see the flashing amber uh, arrow for, for left turning traffic to, to warn them to, to proceed to turn left with, with caution. Um, so that's it. And, and uh, I suppose Joe, Joe Seymour on the call, he, he, he cycles this route quite regularly. And um, you know, he, 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 his experience of, of, of that is, 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 is that the, 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 the situation, including the, the, the flashing amber uh, signal, um, flashing amber arrow signal is, has already improved with, with drivers much more inclined now to, to yield to turning cyclists than, than the situation beforehand. So that's it from me, Paul. Thanks a million, that's great. Uh, Cheers for that. So I'll hand over to Philip Lee now, who's from the NTA's uh, Extra Travel Support Office. Uh, Phil is going to talk about roundabouts and crossings. So uh, over to you, Phil. Okay, so uh, first up then is um, roundabouts. So this is for section 4.6 of the, the manual. So I'll um, go through some of the design principles, um, improvements for existing roundabouts, and then uh, just give a brief summary of the, the different roundabout types uh, covered in the in the manual so some of the some of the design uh, principles so tradition traditional roundabout design uh, would have prioritized motor traffic and uh, would have looked to, to maximize traffic capacity um, which 
which, which can make those types of roundabouts difficult for for pedestrians and cyclists. And the, I suppose the change in, in the design design manual, but I suppose it was in the in the, the previous cycle, uh, the national cycle manual as well, was the that the design principles focus on uh, road user safety rather than than tra- traffic capacity. So, um, with that in mind, the, the design of of roundabouts should look to separate the different road users as much as possible to to reduce um, potential conflicts and also reducing speeds. Uh, reduces severity the severity of the conflicts if uh, if they do occur. So Joe Joe did mention that um, approximately twenty percent of collisions occur at roundabouts, and he's covered some of the the safety issues at at junctions in general, um, and the design pr- principles, um, particularly in relation to driver visibility and and speeds, and uh, I suppose those those principles would apply to roundabouts as well. Um, so. General principles then for for cycle friendly roundabout design uh, include um, uh, just as as I've listed there on the on the left. So slowing down traffic um, by reducing reducing the carriageway down to a single lane and reducing the lane widths. Um, reducing those lanes obviously shortens crossing distances for for cyclists and pedestrians, makes it more uh, safer and more comfortable to to navigate the the entry and exit arms. Um, re- re- reducing the the approach and circulatory lanes in terms of, of width and number of lanes also reduces the number of uh, potential conflicts. So you can see in the bottom right of the, the slide there, it just shows a comparison between conflicts at a, a single lane roundabout and a, and a two lane roundabout. So your your number of com- potential conflict points um, reduces down from, from uh, 24 down to eight uh, when you compare those two types of roundabouts. So that just gives an idea of, of the, that reduction uh, in in lanes alone will re- will reduce the the number of potential conflicts. Um, the approach arms then should should be aligned towards the centre of the roundabout. That's to increase the deflection for vehicles um, and and slow slow them down as they go through the roundabout. Um, and then the approaches themselves should ideally be, if if possible, at, at right angles or as close close as possible. Um, this this is to to uh, improve visibility. And also to improve your your gap gap acceptance for for vehicles. Um, in terms of visibility, obviously, a good visibility between all road users is is essential. So, uh, locating crossings is um is something that needs to be carefully carefully considered. Uh, the another point to mention in in terms of visibility is um sometimes excessive visibility over the central island can lead to to high speeds, high approach speeds, by drivers or else they can fail to actually read the read the junction um and and comprehend what type of junction it is so um designers should consider um some form of uh, uh landscaping maybe soft landscaping uh, to reduce that visibility through the through the central island um at, at multiple lane roundabouts where where there is an issue with traffic or where traffic capacity does need to be um uh maintained for 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 capacity reasons then then the cyclist should be separated so segregated facilities should be provided um and and a cyclist shouldn't have to mix with with traffic now there, there may need to be some traffic modeling done on roundabouts um to to assess this the the impact on capacity um that that some of these cycle friendly measures may may have um but it's i suppose it's worth noting that's that slowing down the speeds um on the approaches and the circle uh, and on the circulatory carriageway uh can improve the gap acceptance so so the the impacts on capacity may not be as negative as as expect uh, as you may expect um improving existing roundabout so in in situations where um you've got a traditionally designed roundabout on on an active travel route then then you would have to consider options for um uh, improving the the walking and cycling facilities so the manual does give um does provide a section on on this because it is it is important it's it's some we, we don't get to design new roundabouts um typically so um what what are the options available um i suppose in terms of least impact or or, or quickest in terms of of uh delivering so we uh, if the traffic conditions are are suitable so low low enough low flows and and low speeds um you could consider uh uh, making the, the junction into a compact shared roundabout so that cyclists mix with traffic. Um, 
if they're not if they're not suitable for for mixed cycling, then then you would obviously look to look uh, to segregate cycle facilities. Another option then would be to um, introduce signal control to the roundabout, and you could have a cycle signal stage to get to get cycles cyclists across the arms. Um, uh, replacing the, the junction itself then with a, with a signalized junction is is another option. Um, and then I suppose that the highest cost option in terms of of uh or in, impact in terms of cost and and potentially environmental impacts would be to would be to provide a grade separated crossing. So just to note at the the last bullet point there, um, it's it's not in it's not in the manual, but but since the publication of the manual, um, there the NTA has released some good, uh, supplementary guidance for for cost effective improvements at at roundabout. So it's there's an, a roundabout retrofit advice note, and that focuses um on the on those two points um on the slide there. So the the lower cost, um, options, uh, which you know uh, will will provide uh or it the, the the advice notes gives different intervention levels that could be um applied to a to a roundabout to provide a, a low cost um low cost interventions. So just moving on to some of the, the roundabout types in the manual. So um there there's three types of protected roundabout in the manual. So the first one gives uh cyclists and pedestrians priority. Um, and this is this round type of roundabout is suitable for for urban areas um, with slower vehicle speeds and um, because there's priority for for crossings and the zebra crossing so you, the the vehicle speeds and uh, should be suitable um, and where you've got demand high demand for pedestrian and, and cyclists to cross um, so uh, designers should refer back to to table four twenty five um, for the traffic speeds and volumes to see if if they're appropriate for for the zebra crossings. So I won't go through in in detail um the 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 layout itself, but just some of the some of the key features really are the the as a, as I mentioned is nar narrow single lane entries, um an overrun area in the in the central island, um it should be should be a rough and surface ideally, um and that's to cater for the larger the larger vehicle movements or it can in a retrofit situation it could actually be used to to narrow down the circulatory carriageway um you may need to run some some auto track uh sweat path analysis just to confirm that the, the space is is there for for vehicles and if if not you, um you could also look to provide overrun areas on the exit uh radio uh there's Par as I mentioned there's parallel uh there's zebra crossings so the parallel zebra crossings for cyclists and pedestrians in their own space uh, the crossings themselves then are set back five meters from the circulated carriageway so that's allow to allow one car to to come off the circulated carriageway without without blocking back and also um just going going back to visibility is to position the car at 90 degrees to the to the crossing so that the, they've got their uh, the, the maximum visibility possible um another Key to mention there, just to, uh, I have an arrow point to to it there is 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 the separation distance between the the cycle track or the exiting cycle track and uh, the exiting uh, traffic lane. So that that gap should be about or should be at least five meters, so that as a driver is exiting and approaching the approaching the crossing, they can distinguish between cyclists that are turning left um away from the junction. And those that are continuing straight towards the crossing, so that uh, to just to avoid that confusion um, and um, not to take uh, motorists by surprise. So that's that's why that that dimension is wider on the the exit side um, than on the entry side. You'll you'll notice in in that diagram. Um, the other benefit with this type of layout, uh, as you can see, the, the large green areas because of the the alignment of the the cycle track. Um, there are opportunities for for landscaping or or soil systems in uh, within within the uh, that distance between the the uh, circulation carriageway and the the cycle track. The next type of roundabout then is in in situations where um, typically you'd be outside of an urban area, um, and cyclists don't don't have priority for crossing. So there are sim similar features in terms of uh, lane widths. And circulatory carriageway widths and overrun areas, but it does differ in that um, the the crossings are the uncontrolled crossings are set back further from the from the carriageway, so they're set back ten meters, and that's that's again that's well at this time is to give pedestrians and cyclists 
time to differentiate between uh, vehicles that are continuing to circulate on the roundabout or or uh, exiting the roundabout um so that they can they can make up make up their mind as to when when there's a, a suitable gap to cross and um because there's no priority across the, the roundabout um this uh, this round or this type of layout is actually suitable for for two way um cycle tracks whereas the the previous version wouldn't be um the cycle track doesn't it doesn't have a, a circular alignment um similar to the the uh, cycle priority roundabout and that's uh purposely to to um reduce speeds on the on the approach reduce cyclist speeds and approach to the uh, to the crossing so that the cycle track turns through 90 degrees just before the crossing um this that alignment also has the benefit of, of reducing the footprint so you, you can you notice the green areas aren't as big as the, the previous version so it's a it's a smaller more comp, compact footprint uh the the last uh roundabout with with protected space for cycling um has a shared uh, active travel facility across around the the roundabout and that's in locations where you've got uh, limited limited space, or in situations where you may have a, a shared active travel travel facility, um, leading up to the to the roundabout, um, so similar to the the, the protected roundabout with cycle priority, the the speeds and volumes should be appropriate for for zebra crossings, and uh, the crossing should be set set back five meters and and raised, um. And the, the share because it's a shared area, um, and and movements can be made in in all all directions. That this this facility is also suitable for two way cycling, and just to note the tactile pavement should be provided at the at the transition between the shared area and the 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 footpaths um on the on the arms. So signal signal controlled roundabouts. So so large large multi round multi lane roundabouts. Um. With signal control are typically not not safe for for cycling. Um, so the preferred solution is is to or the preferred solution will, or solution will be typically to to provide a uh, grade separated cross facilities such as a, a bridge or an underpass. But for retrofit situations, this this may not may not be feasible, um, due to cost or or environmental uh, reasons. So there's there's three uh, at grade alternatives given in in the manual. So the the first one there on the uh, left side of the the the, uh, the diagram on the left is, is a signal control uh, of the the entry and exit arms. So uh, in that in that layout, the crossing should be twenty meters back from the from the carriageway again to prevent blocking back into the roundabout. And um, in that in that situation shown there, the 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 crossing can run, or the, the cyclists and pedestrians are shown as a parallel crossing shown there, and that can run while the the circulatory carriageway is uh, or circulatory traffic is on on a green signal, and um, detection equipment could be provide or should be provided um, as cyclists approach the crossings, um, and then. I think as Noel mentioned earlier, maybe have the backup of a push button unit there if the if the detection uh doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't work. Uh the second option then on the uh top right is hold the left. So that's uh, effectively a, a cycle cycle stage and, and a pedestrian phase while while left turn traffic is is held. Um and then uh traffic leaving when traffic is leaving the roundabout um they can be uh, they can be given a green signal at the same time that traffic is entering entering the roundabout and and cyclists and pedestrians are held. The third option then is uh, crossing the central island. So at at, at a, a large diameter roundabout, sometimes it 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 is actually more convenient to to cross into the into the central island and and um, get across the junction that way. So the the image there is the. Uh, is in Sandyford is the, the M50 inter interchange at Sandyford, and cyclists can can travel from the from the um across the entry arms, and then they they travel uh to and from the central island without without reducing capacity um because they can they can cross while um they cross the entry lanes while the circulatory carriageway is has a green signal, and then they can cross the circulatory carriageway while the the traffic entering has a has a green signal. Uh, the last type of roundabout then is for roundabouts in in mixed traffic. Um, so this would be a, a more typical compact 
roundabout it would be a smaller smaller diameter um, and this this is suitable only for uh, situations where cyclists share the carriageway um, you would have narrow entries um, on the on the approaches and on the circulatory carriageway so so that drivers are dis, uh, discouraged from trying to overtake cyclists and also that that would uh, reduce your your risk of a of left hook collisions uh, coming off the coming off the roundabout because the the cyclists would would take the lane in this this situation um where you have uh where you have space um or where it's required uh, zebra crossings should be provided or raised zebra crossings should be provided and if you have space provide refuges in refuges in the middle um large cycle logos down on the circulatory carriageway helps to to indicate to drivers that it's a that it's a mixed street environment um mini route mini roundabouts then which are a step kind of a step down again from from the roundabouts the compact roundabouts are, aren't covered in the manual but there's there's guidance um uh, in chapter seven on on uh, on the requirements for for mini roundabouts so I won't or I won't cover them here so that's that's the uh roundabout section covered so uh, Paul, if it's okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll move on to uh, crossings. If you want to, yeah, that in sounds the, good. In, in the interest of time, I'll I'll just keep going. Yeah, exactly, and hopefully yeah. we'll have a bit uh, time at the end for yeah. for uh, a couple of Q and A's. Thanks. Okay, so uh, crossings then is actually section four point five, but I think it was probably more logical to have the roundabouts before this, um, so. I'll I'll keep this brief, but but we'll we'll look at uh, the crossing selection guide, um, uncontrolled crossings, and then some controlled crossings, uh, and accurate and a, a a short slide or a quick slide on uh, grade separated crossings. So, uh, the man. So this section four point five. So this this provides guidance on um cycle crossings away from junctions. So mid mid block crossings. Um, and I suppose they're obviously an important part of of the cycle network. So they they uh, and and should allow cyclists to to cross safely and efficiently uh, across the carriageway. So in general, um, where where we provide crossing facilities, they should include for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, at the same location and preferably segregated. Um, but there there are some scenarios where a cycle only crossing may be required, and that the situation may be where you we are moving from a one way cycle track on both sides of the road to a two way track on on one side of the road, and you need a cycle only crossing across the carriageway. So the crossing suitability guide uh, is provided in for uh, table 4.25 and this this gives guidance on the suitability of of the five different crossing types that are that are provided in the manual um depending on the different traffic conditions so the table works in a similar way to table 2.1 which was the cycle facility selection guide which was covered last uh, week so the the green category is where is where you want to be so th those green categories show the types of crossing that, that are suitable for for most users um under certain traffic conditions um and I, I suppose designers should use this table as a as a starting point to to decide on what types of crossing are su suitable for the the traffic regime or the anticipated traffic re regime and then other factors then would need to be considered such as the what's the type of cycle links that are pro um approaching the crossing uh, what are your anticipated numbers of pedestrians and cyclists crossing the road? And um, have you got any, is there any other issues in terms of space constraints? Because um, that will have an impact on the, on the type of crossing that, that is feasible. So I won't, uh, just, just to note, it, note on those, on those tables. So there, there are some asterisks that are, that are quite important. So um, uncontrolled crossings and zebra crossings are not recommended where there's more than one traffic lane. Um, and if the number of lanes can't be reduced, then then you should look uh, to other types of crossings, so the signalised or or grade separ grade separated. Um, and then there's a there's notes on refuge islands, so they should be considered for for all types of uncontrolled crossing, and then for zebra crossings as well, where you've got larger flows, um, they should be considered. 
Um, but in any situation, if 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 a refuge can be provided, uh, I think that's that's an advantageous uh, to to consider those. So the first type of crossing covered in, in the manual are, are uncontrolled crossings. So as the, the name suggests, then there's there's no priority for pedestrians or cyclists. Um, the manual then gives a, a shared or a or a segregated option, and just some of the, the key features there uh, that were well, applicable to both really is that that the refuge island um, should be three meters three meters deep um, down to a minimum of two, but ideally three meters to to cater for for larger um, cycles. Uh, traffic lanes should be reduced to, to 3.25 uh, through the crossing, that, again, to, to slow speeds and to reduce the crossing distances. And uh, the crossing can be can be at grade or, or raised, but the, the preference will be raised crossings where, um, I suppose, conditions are, are suitable. Um, in the the di or the the diagram on the right, where you've where you've got cycle tracks, um, ideally you should provide a a, a buffer or uh, at least bend out the cycle track uh, at the crossing to provide a, a a space for for waiting for cyclists to wait or to stack. Um, and at the shared crossings, then, uh, there's a need to provide tactile paving at the at the uh, the start and end of those spaces. Public lighting again is important at at crossings. So, um. If it's if it's not located at the crossing, there, there should be public lighting at provided. Uh, cycle priority crossing, which is common in the Netherlands, but not uh, not here. So it's it's kind of a new a new uh, type of, of crossing. So this is really only suitable where you've got low uh, low speed uh, traffic and and low flows. Um, priority is given to the to the cyclists, and uh, the motors have to have to yield. There's a stop sign there in the photograph from the, the Netherlands, but the the um the diagram below is from the, the manual where where there's a yield yield markings and the yield sign. Uh, the crossing has to be raised and with a red surface and elephant footprints markings. So that's again that's a a, a new type of feature for for uh, cycle facilities across a, the carriageway, um. Visibility again is is very important. So so designers should check that the, there's a sufficient visibility, intervisibility, I suppose, between between all the road users. And given that it's a, a newer type of crossing, uh, additional warning signs or, or warning signs should be should be provided on the, on the approaches. Several crossings then, um, so they're. Uh, uh, typically appropriate on, on speeds uh, or roads with speeds up to 50 kilometers an hour and they as I mentioned they should be only on on roads with with single a single traffic lane and in in each direction um there are two two options given in the manual so a parallel zebra crossing and a combined zebra crossing so just the, the main features as you as you can see there on the top for the parallel crossing is is dedicated space for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, the red surfacing and elephant's footprint markings um, on the cycle crossing, and that cycle crossing should be three to four meters wide. Um, and the whole crossing is raised with a Belisha beacon uh, or a zebra crossing sign on, on the four corners of the crossing. The one below uh, is the combined zebra crossing, so that's pretty much typical, uh, similar to a typical zebra crossing, um, which are your two two Belisha beacons, but I suppose the, the difference there is the elephant's footprints uh, markings on, on both sides. Again, that should be should be raised. Um, just a note there on the uh, in the manual, it does refer to a, a, a trial for um, zebra crossings without Belisha beacons. So using a, a traffic sign instead. So that that um, that trial has concluded and and there's work ongoing at the moment uh, to amend legislation so to allow for the, the use of those uh, signs um, which is there in the middle of the slide um, and that that will allow crossings to be installed at a much uh, much lower cost compared to to Belisha beacons signal control crossings then so there's there's uh, a, a number of options there but similar to similar to the um, zebra crossings you have uh, you have a parallel option and a and a shared a, a combined option um which is which is the the combined option is there, is, is your typical two can cross which uh, people will be um very familiar with so uh the parallel crossing then 
um, on on the top image is that's the preferred type of control because it, it does give pedestrians and cyclists their own space. Um, and it's recommended on routes where you've got cycle tracks because you can maintain that segregation or that separation um, through the crossing as well. Crossing itself then, similar to uh, the, the zebra crossings, you've got um, red surfacing and elephant's footprints. And um, again, where, the, where there's a, a verge or, a, or a, a buffer between the cycle track, then then the, the verge should be used as a, or can be used as a, a waiting area and stacking space for, for the crossing. Two can cross and then um, I suppose that's probably more suitable where you've got a shared active travel facility coming, uh, leading up to the crossing or where you've got on-road cycle lanes leading to the crossing um, or in, in constrained constrained locations or, or quiet locations. So there are applications there for two can crossings. Again, that should be, uh, as, as it is now in, 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 uh, in terms of the widths, two can cross should be four meters wide. The cycle only crossing, as I mentioned, <clears throat> that can be used if you're transitioning from a, a one way to a two way track. And again, it has the, the elephant uh, elephant footprint markings and dedicated cycle signals. So, uh, last slide then, grade grade separated crossing. So, um, uh, Great separated crossings in can be in the form of of a, a bridge or an underpass, and it, they can they should be considered where where a route crosses, uh, high speed roads, railways, and and waterways. Um, they're safe obviously because they remove the conflict between cyclists and and motor traffic, and um, they can also remove the delay and and provide a continuous uninterrupted route, so that they have significant advantages over the the at grade versions. Uh, the Grade separation obviously would mean that access ramps um are needed and uh will increase gradients and some some diversions um from the most direct route, but um they they can be uh they can be quite comfortable, particularly an underpass where you've you've got the downhill section first and you can use your momentum to get you back up to the other side. Uh they do, however, have higher construction costs and and potential visual and, and environmental impacts. So uh, I won't. I'll, I'll I'll keep this slide brief. But but um, the decision on whether to segregate or share. Uh, so designers should go back to section four twenty seven and and look at the um the section on shared active travel facilities, which gives guidance on whether to share or segregate facilities. And again, also in terms of widths, the width calculator will uh, can be used. Uh, just a, uh, to note on the the ramps, uh, they should be accessible and designed in accordance with the, the NDA guidance. So I think that's booklet one, building for everyone. Um, and then there's there's additional guidance in the manual for headroom and parapet heights. And the last section then just on, on grade separated crosses is, is uh, some details on wheeling ramps or cycle channels, which can be a useful retrofit si situ uh, solution for, for older infrastructure where you've got, you, you need to get up and down steps. That's it, Paul. That's great. Thanks, Philip. And thanks to Noel and Joe again uh, for your presentation.